that it's going to be mind-bogglingly amazing. So again, we're gonna we're going from Landsat 8 right now, which has 11 spectral bands that we can use, to 26 spectral bands. So we're going to be able to image things that we've never had the capacity to image before, and this will continue a legacy of Landsats so more, from 1972. So more bands of light will um, allow us to to look at more um, how different different land covers and different. Mm -hmm. um, areas on the planet are responding to to that incoming electromagnetic radiation so we'll be able to to sort of zoom into minerals and we'll be able, we'll be able to zoom into uh, into plants at the species level in ways that we hadn't been able to do before dr narchiza Procope or Dr. P, as her students call her, is a professor of geography and geospatial science at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, where she studies human environment interactions. She's the director of several important programs at the university and currently is supporting the United Nations. So without further ado, I give you Dr. P. Let's we'll start out with, how do we pronounce your name? A lot of people call me Dr. P, so that's perfectly acceptable, but you would pronounce it Pricope. Narcisa Pricope. Okay, Narcisa. That's that's how it is. Narcisa. Sa, yes. Okay. Not to be mistaken with... Nacho cheese. Nacho cheese right. or narcissist or anything like right. that. Um, I was hoping we could start out with maybe just telling us a little bit about your background, your research, um, and how you got started. Okay, well, I am currently a professor of geography and geospatial science at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Now, geography and geospatial science, when I first started in the field, I didn't know what geospatial science was. All I knew was geography. And I got started with geography, I think, because it was the one thing that made sense to me. I could look at a map and I could look around whatever point of interest I was looking at and somehow it clicked. Somehow it all just made sense. I could take in a map and then go back and write a whole essay about that and populate it with facts about the economy and the people that live there, the ecosystems. So that just came naturally to me and that's how I got started. Um, how I got started on the geospatial side of things um, was by pursuing geography and actually going on a study abroad to Glasgow back when I was a sophomore in college in Romania. I, I did my college in Romania. And so I went on this uh, three-month study abroad, and I stepped into this class that was called GIS. I had no, I had never heard of it before. And I show up, um, there's this lady who was speaking with a really thick um, Scottish accent, and she gets on the blackboard and starts drawing a vector and a raster. And I was, again, it was a whiteboard and I was used to blackboards and I was taking all of that in and yeah. trying to wrap my head around it and none of it made sense. And then we started working with these layers. And by the end of that semester, all these different layers of data became information. We did a suitability analysis and I was just basically God smacked with excitement and um, I thought this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And that was it. That was just that one class where all kind of all the geography I had been exposed to, all these different layers, because it all geography is always about understanding things about the world we live in or an area or a region or a country or a continent. But in chunks, it's always, well, first you learn about the biophysical world, and then you about the rivers, and then you learn about the climate, and then the biosystems, and then the human system. And then GIS essentially allowed me to take it all, put it in a big pat, like a pancake stack, and connect it together and do so quantitatively. And I thought that was really amazing. So that's how I got started. So GIS, Geographic Information, Information system, si Systems, or Science. Or science, yes. Yeah, one of the two. Um, I've always said that I think geospatial has this big marketing problem where no one really knows what it is. Everyone's heard of geography, but yes. when it comes to geospatial, it's what? It's confusing to people. Um, maybe you could explain it in simple terms to, say, an eighth grader, sure. eighth grade level. And the way I even explain it to my seven-year-old daughter who kind of gets it, what GIS is, really 
is, hey, look at a globe like this globe here, right? You can see certain things on it. You can see the water, you can see the clouds, you can see the vegetation, you can see the landforms. GIS is really all about figuring out where things that have a location associated with them are and how they fit together. And what I like to say is I can put all these things side by side or on top of each other and then start asking questions like, why is this happening? Why am I seeing that band of clouds there versus somewhere else? Why is the band of deserts where it is? So it's it's looking at patterns that have a location in the world and trying to figure out why they're the, the way they are. So I feel like that's the power of GIS. And I think people can wrap their head around something being somewhere in space and having relationships with things around them. Uh, I noticed it's very it's very data driven, but it's also very visual. It's a very visual thing. Yes. Everyone can kind of understand a map, yes. right? That's it's the simplest form of GIS. But then going deeper than that, you can you talked about those layers and patterns where you can right identify the relationships, patterns, relationships the, for deeper analysis. Why and the when and the how. Um, along that same lines, uh, how did you start in research? Like, what was your research focus? Mm. Gosh, well, how did I start in research? That also goes back to my time in Romania at um, Babish Boyo University, where I had the pleasure of getting exposed to a field that is very, I, not a lot of people would have heard about geomorphology, but geomorphology is the study of landforms, of why the earth and mountains and rivers, I knew and, that. right? <laughs> these things look the way they look. But it, to me, it always was about the passion of somebody teaching me about said thing. So this professor of mine, he was very passionate and he was well known. And he was he just had a way of imparting that knowledge that just made me excited and it made me want to know more. So that's how I got started that way. And I actually got started by doing an undergraduate honors thesis. And the question I wanted to answer was about the risk of these big, massive landslides that had happened in a previous, you know, a thousand or a hundred plus years ago in the Transylvanian Plateau and whether they were likely to reactivate. So to do that, I had to sit there for hours during my, my senior year in college when other people were partying. I was just sitting in front of my computer, literally digitizing topographic maps. And I think I did about 15 because I wanted to study 15 different landslides. Um, and you know, I just kind of got started that way and enjoyed, I mean, I didn't enjoy the digitizing, but I enjoyed what I was able to to do with that. And I was able to make these cool 3D models. And we're talking 2003. That was not, that was cutting edge for mm -hmm. GIS at the time, especially in Romania, where a lot of people hadn't even begun teaching it or heard about it. So that's what got me started on the, on the research was um, seeing that I could take a topic that, that, other people had studied in different ways in the past and, and bring to it this new technology angle and make it cool and make it, again, visually appealing. And you can make these cool right. 3D models of a topographic map that was on paper when I started. And from that, I just kind of carried on doing research first on rivers and geomorphology um, when I was at doing my master's in Kentucky. And then... Um, that ignited a passion, a passion for watersheds and thinking a little broader scale than like a small landslide. So trying to connect things that are happening in one place to things that are happening a little bit farther away. And that's what got me into my PhD program at the University of Florida. And your, your focus primarily has been the impact of geography and climate on Human conditions? Is that quite the opposite? Safe to in say? fact, it's okay. actually the other All way. Right. <laughs> so I'm a human environment geographer. I study the way, primarily the way humans are impacting their environment. So that is to say that a lot of the work that I do now, and and again, it's all evolved from looking at small processes in a river basin to then my PhD work, which was studying um reconstructing flooding and fire and vegetation changes in a transboundary basin in Southern Africa to what I do now here more locally, which has a lot to do with human impacts on the coast and thinking about, well, how are land uses changing how the coast is responding to storms and flood events, for example. So it's always a mixture of how humans are impacting the environment, but also in turn, the, imp the 
the environment and the way the environment is changing is impacting how people respond. So we call that a feedback loop and a coupled natural human system where both interact and affect each other. Well, you sound like an encyclopedia of knowledge that I could just listen right. to all, all day on that topic. Um, you were recently in the news for being selected uh, to participate uh, in the United Nations uh, in some respect. Can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Yes. So because of a, um, of a project focused on, on creating these open source tools and data sets and selecting the best data sets to monitor land degradation globally, so a project that just ended in September, funded by the Global Environment Facility, Somebody nominated me to serve on the United Nations Combat Convention to Combat Desertification, UNCCD for short. So the UNCCD was actually formed in 1996 in response to the ongoing um, degradation that initially started in the Sahel region. And all global nations thought, oh my gosh, we have a massive problem. The desert is expanding. So the world kind of pitched together in the 90s and said, we have to create a body that We'll keep an eye on how this degradation is affecting humans because it's not only happening in Sahel, it's happening all over the world now. So anyways, the UNCCD is um, a unique body within the United Nations that is tasked with understanding or, or uh, monitoring and reporting on how, how we're doing and how we're progressing on land degradation because land degradation affects, currently the estimate is that it affects about 2 billion people globally. And it's it's um, land, imp- land degradation, land degradation, meaning um, the the sort of the slow or fast inability of the land to support the people that live on it and the it. and the animals and ecosystems, broadly speaking. So if you have a, 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 a nice savanna in an area and then that savanna starts being covered, literally, that's one form in sand coming in from the desert, mm-hmm. that land is no longer being use, useful or usable by people or by animals. So that we call that land degradation. So anyways, this body, the UNCCD, has a, um, a mechanism through which it's able to take the most recent scientific knowledge and bring it to policymakers and make recommendations to policymakers. And that's through uh, the science policy interface. And that's what I was appointed to. Okay, so you're essentially... So essentially, my role there will be to work alongside 14 other uh, members of the SBI to bring the most recent understanding and scientific knowledge on drought, aridity or aridification, desertification and land degradation to policymakers so that we can essentially achieve the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development, which um, says that we should really start getting to a land degradation neutral world by 2030. So in order for How would we do that? Yeah, so in order to do, so we can do that by um, stopping new degradation and by restoring areas that have already been degraded. So all countries, 196 countries are party to the, to this UNCCD convention. Um, And they have agreed to set different targets. So each country sets its own set of targets and says, okay, we are going to reduce degradation by not deforesting anymore, as an example, Mm -hmm. right? Other countries are saying, well, we're going to go and plant 1 billion trees to to reforest an area or or, um, so restore land restoration and avoiding further degradation. So it's really neat. Mm -hmm. And we just had our first meeting that ended yesterday, in fact. Um, and it's always been a dream of mine to be to work with the UN in some capacity. And I have in the past, a long time ago. But this was this is this is where it all. I feel like all my work, in, especially in in Africa, Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, of the last fifteen years since I did my PhD, is finally kind of coming to to a point where um, hopefully it will be used for some policy making. Because ultimately. As academics, people always ask us, so what, what's the, what, what is the point? Why are you doing what you're doing? And we always, or at least I always like to say that, well, hopefully it's useful for, for land management, for policymakers. And I feel like this is bringing that dream to, to some sort of fruition. So everyone inside the CCD, basically they get together and they say, these are the things that we recommend 
these countries do to stop land degradation? Or is the recommendation more general than that? No, they can't tell a specific country what to do. That's why Mm. I said countries set their own targets and they set their own sort of how they want to achieve that land degradation neutrality. But the UNCCD does the work of reviewing the most recent science and putting recommendations out there um, just at a broad level Mm -hmm. globally so that each country then um, they will be bound by some. So if they if if the convention says everybody has to reduce degradation by five percent by 2030, everybody has to do it to be in compliance. Mm-hmm. But they choose how to do it and um, when and how to stagger that and everything else. But they do have to report to the UNCCD. So here in coastal North Carolina, uh, what would be some ways that we could help reach that goal, whatever that is for the United States. Oh, but the, the United States does not report as part of the United <laughs> States is the only country in the world that doesn't actually report to the UNCCD on, on this topic. Wait, the last, yes. should I ask why? Is there a why there? I don't... <laughs> sure. But the last assessment uh. that, was, that came out, um, everybody reported except um, the Arctic, Antarctic, and the United States. So we don't know. Because for some reason, I have to still dig into that. I was a little bit shocked myself, and I can't tell you why, mm-hmm. but the United States hasn't reported in the last uh, assessment. Okay. Uh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> I'd be curious to know why that is either. <laughs> uh, who knows? Um, for the same reason that we're no longer signatories in the Paris Climate Agreement? Could be. I mean, maybe it's a political thing. Who knows? Um <laughs> Uh, the other thing that you were recently in the news about was the UAS obser- observatory here in North Carolina that mm-hmm. you're beginning. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yes. So um, as of September of this year, a lot of things have happened in September of this year, 2022. Um, the NSF uh, award to um, National Science Foundation, the National Science Foundation major mm-hmm. research, research instrumentation grant award to the University of North Carolina Wilmington. Um, was official, and it allows us to purchase um, a suite of instruments to equip the first um, coastal UAS UAS observatory. UAS stands for Unoccupied Aerial Systems, or drones for short. And that that will allow the university to be the first one, actually, in the southeast that we know of, or in the east part of the country, to have access to some very cutting edge, but not just one, multiple drones that will work together in an integrated fashion to image various aspects of the coast. So we can, so we'll have a um, a lidar, a topobathymetric, a hyperspectral, additional multispectral cameras, and um, some in situ instrumentation, meaning just instruments that we deploy in the field mm-hmm. um, to start asking and answering questions about how the coast is changing, how toxins are affecting our water, um, our surface water, such as harmful algal blooms or even other um, types of, of chemicals that we can measure um, through hyperspectral imaging um, or um, things that pertain to to more of the vegetation environment and how ghost forests are um, migrating inward and how marshes are changing and what's all a, these kinds. What's a ghost forest? A ghost forest um, is a essentially a former cypress tree a tree mm-hmm. stand or or forest that, that is unable to cope with um, increasing sea level rise and we see them all over the coast here. So they're just basically dead stumps that are standing but are dead because mm-hmm. they're they are they're used to a brackish or freshwater system and all of a sudden they're getting inundated with salt water because of sea level rise and salt water intrusion mm-hmm. into our aquifers. So that's a ghost forest. And we can start measuring some of these, some of these um, processes that are very slow moving and hopefully um, add to a, to a body of knowledge that tells us more about how the coasts are changing and how that's affecting our livelihoods and our ecosystems. So you're getting access to a bunch of different equipment, a bunch of different sensors, including LIDAR, topobathymetric LIDAR, which is essentially LIDAR that can see it's a through green, the water. It's a green band LIDAR that can penetrate the water column. And there's there are very many unknowns as to how well that penetration can happen in... Um, 
tannic waters or the black waters that we have around mm-hmm. here. So that's a huge area of interest, and that's of interest to to the to the Department of Transportation, to um, the Army Corps, to a lot of different stakeholders. So that'll be so. Topo bathymetric lidar is a new application, also very much of interest to commercial companies in the area that have to survey areas that are covered in water where mm-hmm. your regular lasers like lidars don't penetrate. So we can start getting a sense of very shallow bathymetry, i.e. the water depth in in areas that are covered in water, but the water is not very deep. Where we can't take a sonar or some other instrumentation that is used in the in the more um, deep part of water bodies. So this is a really nice system for imaging shallow water depth. Okay, and then all these assets that you're going to have access to, is that related to the FAA agreement that you have with the university? So the Coastal UAS Observatory will be sitting at the Center for Marine Science. It will mm-hmm. become a core facility at the Center for Marine Science that will add to the existing many other types of instrumentation and facilities we have. Um, and again, it will help us answer a lot of these applied research questions of interest to a lot of stakeholders. Um, and this is not directly related to the, to the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration um, UAS Collegiate Training Initiative that our school is a part of, but it is, they go together very nicely because the FAA initiative is there to support um, schools that have a lot of UAS or a lot of drone coursework and drone um, research experiences for students and to make sure that we're all adhering to a set of standards across the board and that we are producing students that, um, that we're, we're developing a workforce that can go out and get jobs and be at the cutting edge and um, respond to demand in industry and government as far as the needs and where, where, the, fields are, where the field is going. So you're working with the UN, you're the director of the Coastal UAS Observatory. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you... I also direct our Geospatial Intelligence Certificate at UNCW, which is accredited by the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation. I'm also the coordinator of our graduate GIS certificate, which is a UNCW degree program, and I'm leading the FAA UAS um, Collegiate Training Initiative. So I guess I'm a little bit busy. Yeah. Do you Plus, sleep? I'm also I managing mean... <laughs> a couple other projects, one funded by NASA and one funded by the NCDOT that all started in September, <laughs> as I said. Yeah. Big month. Yes, I don't sleep very much because I have a baby. <laughs> 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 so it's helpful. <laughs> um, sounds like you have quite a bit going on. Uh, how do you balance all that? I mean, there's... How do you manage your time doing all those things? I have a very supportive spouse at home that... um, I hear he's the best. Yeah, right. It's helpful from five to seven. (laughs) You can cut this if you want. (laughs) Um, Yes, I think what I can tell you that it it does help to have a child or two because they teach you um, you how to manage your time and how to become very efficient. I've never been as efficient as I have been since I've had a child because you know your time away from them Mm -hmm. is your time away from them. So you make the best of that time and you get a lot done in a short amount of time. I think that's my secret right there is... So your secret to time management is have kids because they force you <laughs> into working a set number of hours because you have to pick them up at yes, some point. You have to pick them up and you you don't want to take away attention from when you're with them, from them, from being with them and from being present. So you really have to manage your time really well. And And secondly, or thirdly, because I guess the spouse is the first one. You surround yourself, or I have had the the great luck and honor of surrounding myself with some really, really hardworking, passionate graduate students, undergraduate students that mm-hmm. um, that really help make all of this happen. And when I say I have all these things and I'm managing, I am managing all these things, but the day-to-day work on some of these projects really does come down to graduate research assistants. So I'm currently employing about five or six students on all these different projects full-time, um, so I'm managing them, getting the work done. So it's not it's not a one person shop. It's it's a multiple people, but it's the only way that we can we can get this done. And right. at the end of the day, 
the students walk away with all of that experience and they are at the, true at the truly at the cutting edge um, in their field. So, so it works out for everybody. Well, that was one thing I wanted to ask you about was this current generation of students. Uh, I think people my age, you know, around 40 years old, uh, you constantly hear how the next generation coming up, you know, is soft and, all, and that sort of thing. Has that been your experience? No, but I'm, it depends. Not necessarily. It hasn't been my experience all that much. I also am kind of selective as to the people I choose that I, that mm -hmm. to work with. But in general, I have found that I can take even the, the you know, your most, maybe not soft, but Sometimes I work with with students that need a lot more pushing from behind and a lot more motivation than others do. Um, but I think that if you give the right, if you give students and if you give, give the people you work with the right structure, the structure to thrive and you give them enough freedom, but also enough direction and you support them, then they will they will rise to any challenge and they will meet expectations. So I think it's a lot. Yeah, that's that's to do been with how you manage. That's people. been my experience as well. I think every generation wants to say that you know we used to walk uphill nine miles in the snow to get to school, uh, but in reality, life's always gotten a little easier as time moves on. I mean, we're seeing now with things like Chat GPT and this new AI surge, mm -hmm. we're seeing people aren't going to have to write much anymore, or at least they'll they'll write and they'll do a lot of their brainstorming using AI tools and leveraging um, this kind of new era of tools that help us brainstorm and research and um, help us organize our tasks and things like that. Where do you see your field moving to um, with all these new AI tools coming out? Um, obviously, GIS is right for this type of automation. Um, what, are your, what are your predictions for where your field well, moves to. I, I'll give you my predictions, although I'm not Nostradamus. But um, before that, I want to kind of go back to a comment you made about this generation and about um, how we've always had it hard and we think we've had it harder than the current generation. And um, I think I come from a developing country. I grew up in Romania in a small town. I had it hard coming, you know, coming here to the U.S. It wasn't easy for me, but I am actively recruiting students who are international students just like me. And even with those students and other students, I try to make their life easy. I want to make sure that they don't have to go through and jump through all the hoops that I jump through. Um, and I'm always there and I'm always willing to try the next new thing, bringing me to what you're asking me about. So I am completely okay with students not having to work as hard or to put in as much sweat equity as we used to have, you know, we had to do things on paper. We had to do things in massive mm -hmm. spreadsheets. Now we can automate all those tasks and write a few lines of code that take out, you know, hours and hours of work that I would have had to have done or people coming before me. So um, there's nothing, I mean, there's, it's, it's great that we live in an era that where technology is changing so fast and now this AI is stepping in to hopefully make our life even easier. So I think um, chat GPT, and I'm assuming people on your channel will know all about it because you seem to have spent some time they better late, know about it. <laughs> lately talking about it. But I see that as a huge, huge um, gain for, for folks in, geospatial, in the geospatial field and geospatial intelligence, because if you can get an AI to help you write the first draft of your code, and then right. you can take that code and you can get really creative with it. But instead of writing it from scratch, you get to modify it and make it better and perfect it. I think that will be a great, a great win. And I don't see that as, again, having to sit there and write them from scratch. You know, we don't need to do a lot of things from scratch anymore. And there's nothing wrong with utilizing what's out there. Um, in a way, I think in the future, how do how do I predict this affecting the field? I think it'll just, you know, what we need in the geospatial intelligence field is we need the ability to to work with the huge, huge volume, diversity, and velocity of data coming to us, right? The the big data, the 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 four Vs, velocity, volume, um, and um, 
whatever the other one is. But essentially... <laughs> that sounds like two Vs. <laughs> no, there's four Vs. Um, but so what we need is we need to be able to find ways to sift through this massive amount Verocity, of data of and information constantly right. coming at us. We're, we're putting in new satellites. My gosh, we are putting the next gen Landsat satellite up there. Mm -hmm. And we're going from 10, 11, 6, 11 bands that we started off That's with to 26 NASA's, spectral bands. NASA's new Landsat yes, NASA's satellite. New, Can you talk about that a little bit? Do you know anything about that? Well, I just know that I'm not sure when it's planned to launch, but I mm -hmm. do know that it's going to be mind-bogglingly amazing. So again, we're gonna we're going from Landsat eight right now, which has 11 spectral bands that we can use to 26 spectral bands. So we're going to be able to image things that we've never had the capacity to image before. And this will continue a legacy of Landsats so more, from 1972. So more bands of light. Will um, allow us to, to look at more, um, how different, different land covers and different mm -hmm. um, areas on the planet are responding to, to that incoming electromagnetic radiation. So we'll be able to, to sort of zoom into minerals and we'll be able, we'll be able to zoom into, uh, into plants at the species level in ways that we hadn't been able to do before. Um, so what you'll I'm saying to, is... You'll be able to see plant species from a satellite? Possibly so. I, ha I don't know exactly. Again, I haven't studied. But I just mm -hmm. know that the 26 uh, spectral bands are going to to sort of fill in some of the gaps where in the in the shortwave infrared and, and parts of the spectrum where we previously weren't able to image because of um, atmospheric windows of transmission not, not mm -hmm. allowing us to do so. So the technology is evolving. And there you go. This all of this work, all of the AI, all of these capabilities are allowing us to do things unprecedented or things that we weren't able to do before. Um, and so I think the future, again, is all about lots of data coming to us in, mm -hmm. in even more detail, even more spatially and spectrally uh, resolved and detailed, and how we put all of that together. Um, the AI can help us automate a lot of the functionality, but I think we're still, the, the future still will require people that can actually uh, understand the science and, and make distinctions mm -hmm. and make connections and bring all of this um, AI together. Because the AIs can only handle right small tasks. Like a man, when you tell him, go take out the trash, but don't forget <laughs> to pick up the, the bags around it, right? So the AI is that doing the robotic task, but it's not necessarily going to see the things around and make the connections in the same way that humans will, quite possibly. So the future is AI centered perhaps, but human driven still. I believe the future generation, the, the successful people in the future are going to be the people that can leverage AI across the, do the, the various tasks that they have, but there's still going to be that big sweat equity component to it. Um, like you said, AI is only really good at for now, simple types of tasks that will get better, obviously, over time. Um, the successful pe people of the future will be able to use it in a way that gets them to that next point, to that mm -hmm. deeper level of understanding. And they'll be experts at leveraging the technology and getting getting to that, um, you know, level 10 knowledge, so to speak. I think it I think what it does, it saves a lot of time. That's you what know, I'm saying. It, it helps you automate these more mon mundane tasks mm -hmm. while while allowing the the trained um, geospatial analyst or your trained um, data scientist to think about okay, how does this piece here that the mm -hmm. AI can solve in this way fit with this other piece that deep learning can solve in this other way? So I feel like that's where where why we need the next generation of data scientists and geospatial scientists and analysts to make these connections. So. Um, that's one that's one of the things that I like to do a lot in my classes is make people think about, okay, great, we can write a script to extract, to do all the filtering, to run a classification, to run seven types of classification, 10 times, 10 types. But what do we do with all of that? And how do you interpret it? And how do you communicate it? That's the piece that's really important. How do you contextualize mm -hmm. it? And how do you make it fit in with everything else we know? So it's always about the big picture. It's always about making the connections and always really about understanding why. Like, why does it work this way? Why do we need the extra 15 bands on the Landsat satellite? Why do we need the AI to 
to answer X, Y, Z question, right? So why is why are the why piece? I guess mm-hmm. the AI can start kind of getting at that with enough training. It has to be trained, yeah. right? I mean, uh, even if you look at chat GPT, it is only limited to the models or sorry, to the information that it's exactly. been trained That's upon. Yeah. So um, it's it's crazy right now with these these language models. There's actually quite a bit of competition. Chat GPT is just kind of the first one that's in the field, but Google has one called Lambda, which supposedly is is insane. One of the developers said that he believed Lambda was sentient, mm-hmm. that it had feelings, and it was talking mm-hmm. to him and saying, "Hey, you know what I really fear is being turned off. Mm-hmm. You know, at what point does the machine?" Uh, have a consciousness, you know, that's kind of a crazy question, but um, it sounds like people in your field are going to be leveraging it quite a bit. For sure. Yeah. There's no reason not to. Um, Again, if they can understand why they're do, why the AI is doing what it's doing, and then also understand on the back end of that, how to, how to use it, how to communicate it and how to, to, to leverage it for whatever the next um, thing they need is. So you're you're doing quite a bit um, across the board with a bunch of different um, things with the UN, the UAS Observatory, things like that. What advice would you give to future geography professors that want to be just like Dr. P? Future geography professors. Well, the the field is changing, and I think. Um, Increasing, I think the the one piece of advice would be to to diversify, to be interdisciplinary, and to to not be scared to be interdisciplinary. I think a lot of why I'm able to do all the different things and the directions um, that I'm taking um, are is because we or I have been trained to be interdisciplinary. I have been trained to work with other scientists from other fields at a level that where I can communicate what I need to communicate and I, mm-hmm. and I can put myself sort of in the room and, and have enough knowledge to understand what they're saying. So being interdisciplinary, being open to work with other people and being able, able to and open to bringing other disciplines to the table to answer complex questions, I think is a necessity and a, complete, a, a huge plus. Um, what would be an example of how another discipline could leverage your knowledge in the GIS geospatial. Yeah, arena. so a, a, an easy example is this um, project that we are wrapping up right now. So it was a project that was awarded to um, us researchers from four different states, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina by mm-hmm. the Sea Grant, by the National Sea Grant, which essentially is money that is funded through um, NOAA, the National um, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So that that project has economists and and straight up law um, law professors on board. Mm-hmm. And so the the idea was that economists don't know anything about GIS. We don't know anything about their economic models they're running yet. Right. Together, we are now. Um, about to present results that show how sea level rise will be affecting our coastal infrastructure and leading to job losses and business losses over the next 30 years because we are able to bring in the GIS data. We are able to to simulate sea level rise and see what areas Mm -hmm. it's going to impact, what buildings, what businesses, what roads. They then plug in this data into their economic models. And at the end of the day, we can say, okay, if we go on doing nothing about sea level rise, for example, these are the costs. This is how much it's going to cost us in economic, in dollars. So once, so, so that's one example of an easy, we take geospatial analyses and we put, we put a dollar sign on that, but we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily trained to do these kinds of benefit cost mm-hmm. analyses and PNL and all these kinds of things, but they are. So we work together. And then we work with uh, law professors who are helping us understand how to communicate um, the fact that perhaps by putting in something like green infrastructure, for example, or which green means infrastructure. green infrastructure is um, is an approach to dealing with various aspects of flooding and sea level rise by um, by 
putting in wetlands and bioswales and, and um, working with nature instead of building more levees or groins mm-hmm. or elevating roads, which are you know, your normal gr- uh, gray infrastructure measures of dealing with you know water kind of coming into the same mm-hmm. area multiple times. So the law, the law professors are doing the po- policy analyses and helping us understand, okay, where would you make that recommendation? Where would it fit? Under what law? Under what mm-hmm. jurisdiction? How does that work? So that's an example of being nimble and being interdisciplinary and answering questions that are complex, such as how does sea level rise affect infrastructure? Not one field can answer that question. You need engineers, you need geographers, you need economists, you need policy law, law and policy um, people at the table to kind of begin to tackle that question in a way that can actually be used impactfully. What I've learned is that geospatial is really a horizontal market. Mm-hmm. Uh, the reason I enjoy it is because you can apply it in anything like you're talking about, legal, economy, whatever you want to plug it into, there's applicability because geospatial data is just location data. Everything right. happens somewhere. Yeah. So it has applicability to businesses that want to mm-hmm. uh, you know, do research on new markets that they want to tackle. Um, It has applicability to healthcare professionals that need to know where the centers of disease are Mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, So I think it's a great field for anyone that's looking to explore geospatial intelligence. And it's highly, it's a field with high degree of employability at the moment. Students are not hurting for for jobs. They are finding jobs, especially if they come out. Mm -hmm being able to really talk about what they can do and and showing that they can do things. So we need more geography degrees and less dance theory degrees. I'm not going to comment on that. (laughs) (laughs) I think people that that have have an intuition for for maps and, and spatial data and that think they would enjoy looking at and creating data and information should come see us, yes. Okay. And but they can also take dance theory. That's just perfectly fine. <laughs> My guess is there won't be too many job opportunities for you if you decide to pursue dance theory. Uh, unless there's a dance theorist out there that's killing it, I'm not really aware. But uh, as a so you would consider obviously geospatial as part of the STEM yes, field. Yes, it is definitely a STEM field. Okay. Um, because geospatial is inherently built on mathematical sciences, mm-hmm. um, geometry, trigonometry, all of that is built in there, physics even, right? Because you, you can't study mm-hmm. remote sensing and you can't work with drones and satellite data if you don't have a basic understanding of physics. I think it's crazy to think about all of the things that you're talking about and then on the flip side, there's people out there that think the earth is flat. <laughs> <laughs> is the earth flat? Yeah, well, they just zoom in on your globe over there. and <laughs> yeah, Oh, no. but this is manufactured. This is, you yeah. know, this is set up by Hollywood or something, you know. Yeah. That's what they say. Um, it's funny. I posted some, some stuff on uh, one of the social media things and uh, all these flat earth people on there saying, you know, this can't happen. Oh, what I posted was about plate tectonics and, mm-hmm. and the future, all these flat earth people said, oh, it can't happen because the earth is flat. And mm-hmm. We'll run out of space when these plates <laughs> are pushing up right. away, right? Yeah. Where, where do you even, how do you even start with people <laughs> like that? Um, do you get people in your courses that believe that? Honestly, I don't think they make it to my courses if they believe in that, right? Because I would debunk that in three split seconds. How would you debunk the flat earth theory in three seconds? Your plate tectonics example is a great example. You can talk about, okay, well, look at the horizon. Does the horizon look like the earth is ending anywhere nearby? I mean, it's just there's so many ways that you can start explaining that. You can start thinking about the way the earth is. I mean, gosh, the earth revolves around the sun. Mm-hmm. How does a flat thing, uh, uh, I don't know. again, <laughs> nothing that I, I would ever teach would, would 
allow people to still believe that even if they were to come in thinking that. But I don't think I always make a joke about it in the intro classes and nobody uh-huh. ever puts up their hand and says that they're so so like I said, I don't think they come to the kinds of classes. You got it. They're in the dance theory class. So Again, I don't know, Nick. I don't know why you're picking on dance theory today. But Is that actually a course? I just made I that up. Know. I have no I, idea. I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I have, I have no idea. But uh, to my dance theory colleagues, please don't take it personally. I have nothing to do with this. I'm sure you have quite a few dance theory colleagues. Um, if so, we've definitely ripped them to shreds so far. But it's all good. Maybe me more than you. Yes, I have you said nothing. To comment. Yes, I can't. Why not? Why can't you talk about it? What I, you love? Don't you think? Don't you love being entertained? You watch Netflix every night or some kind of entertainment, right? A lot of those people for you to get good shows and good movies on, you need people that are experts in dance theory. So let's end that there. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> not the shows I watch. <laughs> I'm not watching musicals and things like that. Um, okay, so back to uh, I want to talk about the UAS Observatory a little bit more. Those those different sensors that you have access to. You talked about lidar. Could you maybe explain lidar to an eighth grader? Yes, lidar is essentially. Um, I've shown it to my seven seven year old. It's a, basically a box that you attach on. In this case, we put it on drones, but these boxes can go on satellites. We have Jedi. These boxes can go on airplanes. Jedi is a, it's a it's a it's a satellite born lidar that exists to to measure. Anyways, to to look okay. at uh, forests, but it's essentially like a box that inside of it has a laser system, so a, a, a light beam that sends out a pulse, like multiple pulses per second, in fact. And every time that light pulse hits an object, you get a return, an intensity return, and you get a timestamp on that. So you basically are using just um, a speed of light equation to figure out how fast that beam of light Duh. is traveling and coming back to you, and that allows us to calculate. Um, distance away from our instrument. Again, this, these LIDARs can be put on different instruments at different elevations. Um, and that way you can sort of reconstruct how high vegetation is. You can reconstruct multiple canopies, in fact, within a vegetation structure. So you can get your top of your trees, your middle canopy, your ground returns. And then you can start, obviously, um, measuring anything that that happens to pop up on Earth. Structures, utilities, um, cars that are moving, humans that are standing still, all of these things. So you can essentially use that return, the timestamp of that return to calculate how far away something is and create some really, really awesome three-dimensional um, structural products. So the the so, sensor is making beams of light mm-hmm. go down and then where that light returns, creates a point. Exactly. Right? And exactly. Then you... Yes. It creates a point. So so what we record is, you know, you record the intensity, but we also record points of that return. And that allows us to, from these point, we call them point clouds, from these point clouds to reconstruct essentially the structure of objects. Like if we were pointing a laser to this cool mm-hmm. wolf over here, we could get its teeth and all of the details that it has um, and reconstruct it essentially just from an, an object like a laser, like a LIDAR mm-hmm. um, flying above it at different angles. And that LIDAR works the same as the LIDAR that's in the Apple phone, right? The iPhone? Yeah. Essentially the same thing. It's just essentially a the smaller same thing. version on the phone. That, the, this, the phone runs something that's more similar to a terrestrial LIDAR system, which would be as a LIDAR placed on an object that rotates around because mm-hmm. with your phone, you would rotate around the room to reconstruct the structure of that room and the terrestrial terrestrial LIDAR does about the same thing. And what we're talking about is these things that are airborne. So then we have to um, reconstruct not only the cloud, the point clouds and kind of what we're getting back from the laser, but also reconstruct that motion of the, of the object that is flying and carrying that. So there's an add a layer of excitement there that we have to use um, gyrometers and accelor- accelerom- accelerometers. Yes, accelerometers <laughs> to reconstruct the motion of that object and then put those together to create cool products, 3D products that can be used in construction, um, 
and vegetation analyses, forest inventories is a huge area, and and so on and so forth. Okay, so you have all these. So you have, I have all these cool things. Mm-hmm, a lot of cool things. So <laughs> yeah, you said lidar. Topobathymetric lidar. Topobathymetric was which is that. hyperspectral. Hyperspectral, which is. Uh, what, what makes what's the difference between a hyperspectral and multi? So we have a multispectral tan band um, sensor that we just acquired. Mm-hmm. We we have others at UNCW that are four band usually five bands, um, but this one will give us information not only in the blue, green, red, near infrared parts of the spectrum, which are fairly standard in remote sensing, uh, but also into um, thermal with the multispectral. Mm-hmm. So essentially, it's allowing us to to um, image an area using in in multiple um, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and to see how how um, the surface is responding to the interaction with these parts of the incoming solar radiation Mm -hmm. because these are all passive sensors but then a hyperspectral takes that range say the same range maybe from um, blue to um, close to thermal and it breaks it up instead of five or six or ten bands but it breaks it up into 200 plus bands so we're getting super super thin portions of that which that's the kind of imaging that allows us to go down to species level truly and it allows us to go down to um, even penetrate through the water column to some extent with some of these hyperspectrals or um, it allows allows geologists if they were to use the technology to to dr- drill down into minerals within mm-hmm. rock formations and to look for I mean, maybe not the kind of hyperspectral we're getting, but um, a lot of hyperspectral sensors out there that go beyond, uh, uh, say, um, 2,000 nanometers. They can go and start looking at soil compositions and, again, so super fine, fine super detailed um, components of, of, of rocks that influence so how, what we can grow in an area and how crops would respond or how different crops would do or do, wouldn't do well with with different uh, with uptaking different nutrients from the soil. So when you talk about bands of light, um, just to make it make it easy to understand, you're t- really talking about Roy G. Biv, the colors yes. of the rainbow, and then even yes. beyond that, so red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, mm-hmm. uh, and then you mm-hmm. leverage infrared to. So see. infrared comes after red, yes. Infrared, we leverage well, that before red, right? No, because on the visible well, the way, spectrum, the way I have so you, oh, the okay. way you well, said, I guess you but it's say really it either usually way. flipped because you start off with the short wave bands over here. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know how I usually explain it, and then you end up on this the right side of that spectrum because light comes to us right mm-hmm. as as a, a big mass of of particles um mm-hmm. but and they don't necessarily we don't we only break down that incoming light into these spectral bands for explanation illustration purposes but it all comes to us right. kind of at the same time um but the infrared allows us to look at vegetation and it allows us to look at chlorophyll a and chlorophyll b and pigments in vegetation that then give us an indication of stress levels and plant health and um, senescence and things like that, or meaning how how plant is green or a plant is going towards losing part of its beta carotene and chlorophyll and becoming yellow and red leaves and then dropping. So that allows so these these sensors allow us to to really look into into plants for for agricultural purposes for ecosystem modeling purposes in ways that we can't with the naked eye. So you're spending a lot of time manipulating light. Light. You're spending a lot of. Well, we're spending not. We're not. We're not manipulating the light. We're manipulating um, the information captured by these sensors, whether on a drone or on a satellite. They mm-hmm. capture a picture of that. The way that that plant or those plants or those communities interact with the light at at the moment that they they're being imaged, at the moment that that image is taken. And so we spend time manipulating those digital images that give that essentially contain more or less um, brightness values. So they contain a spectrum of of color from dark, from black to white, and we call that a brightness value. And that brightness value we then process through um, 
we, we remove atmospheric effects and we do all sorts of things to that to get what we call at the end of the day a reflectance value or or um a quantitative measure of how a surface, different surfaces are interacting with that light. So really, we're just working with these numbers, with these digital numbers, these numbers that exist in an image that, that are proxies for biophysical conditions. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. I got it. I'm ready. I'm ready to get, <laughs> manipulate some light. <laughs> Again, you're not manipulating the light. You're just manipulating the digital numbers the that result from that interaction of that light right. with, with the earth. Okay. Uh, what are some different things that you could do with that information? You can um, make land use maps. You can make land cover and land use maps and use them to plan how your city is developing, to plan green spaces, to plan um, to plan ways to improve the land conditions in a city. For example, mm -hmm. you can take that information and use it for early warning systems, for crop failures or for crop disease and crop stress. Um, you can take that information and use it to... Um, a lot of different uses. Uh, I got it. <laughs> you, you can take that information and and then bring it into and use um, use it to understand why certain disease outbreaks are happening in one area versus another area, or why animals are using mm -hmm. a certain habitat but not that habitat or that area nearby. So again, like you were saying earlier. It's all part of this really big horizontal market, and you can use the technologies if you understand how to leverage that, right? How to leverage, essentially, the way light interacts with the surface of the Earth. And again, you do it from drones, you do it from air, from airplanes, you can do it from satellites. And being able to, to leverage that, essentially, can help you answer questions that pertain to water resources, agriculture, forestry, uh, soils, uh, you name it. I mean, it's there. Climatology, meteorology. People use satellites and this interaction of light with objects to look at clouds and aerosols and understand how um, aerosols are determining the formation of rainfall in an area, but not in another area. I mean, the, the applications are huge, enormous, in fact. And some we're not even tapping into. And in fact, we're putting in new satellites every day because there still are processes on the surface of our Earth that we don't understand or that we don't have enough data to what, understand. For. What are those big gaps? What are those areas that we don't quite understand yet? Oh my gosh, I think it uh, depends on who you talk to. Mm -hmm. But in my, in my field, I can only speak from my field, I, still, I think we still have a lot to understand about how... Um, just simple land use. I mean, I know it sounds like a simple thing. How land use is affecting the global climate system and the global functioning mm -hmm. of 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 the climate. So there's still there are still feedbacks um, that operate at, at different scales that we don't understand, that we don't fully have a way of of closing the gaps in global climate models aerosols and land use and human activities are a big part of that. So that's why we're always doing all this work, trying to measure the impacts of human activities on the globe, on earth, on how we use land and how that land is doing. So again, that's why resources like the Landsat constellation is so important. And that's, you know, a lot of times people say, well, gosh, do we need another satellite, right? And they'll say, well, mm -hmm. why is NASA spending billions of dollars on a new satellite? Well, it's because they give us, they give us all this breadth and depth of knowledge and of data that allows us to, to look back in time and figure out, okay, this, this area has changed in this way and it's affected, um, the area next to it, and we call these teleconnections. So, so things that are happening in the Amazon are affecting climates for the whole globe, right? Things that are happening mm -hmm. in the Congo Basin, things that are happening in North America influence, or oh my gosh, things that are happening in North Africa lead to hurricane on hurricanes on our east coast. So, so we have these huge connect connectivities among 
systems and components of our planet. That well, you just said hurricanes yes. are occurring because of stuff that's happened in that Africa. Happens in Can North you explain Africa. that? Yes, indeed. Storms. So, so, so land degradation is leading to desertification, the expansion mm -hmm. of deserts in North Africa. And that leads to more, simplistically speaking, I'm simplifying this, but that leads to, to, more, to more wind and dust storms. And those dust storms produce a lot of dust that ends up in the atmosphere and it gets carried over the, the, the eastern part of the Atlantic Ocean and it creates nuclei for condensation, so for cloud formation. And when the more of these that we have, the more of these sand particles, the more nuclei for condensation we, we get, the more cloud formation and instigation of these systems that then start spinning out of control and becoming hurricanes on the U.S. Atlantic coast. So when you ask me, okay, why do you work on the UNCCD thinking about land degradation as a global mechanism? It's because things that happen in North Africa do impact our climate and the kinds of storms and the kinds of uh, magnitude and intensity of storms we get on the Atlantic East Coast. And there so, you go. So the butterfly effect is a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm talking about the, the, the sandstorm effect, but yes, no, not the butterfly. But you you get the point, right? The world is, right, is, is made up of these really tightly interconnected components and yes, so it's we're, important. We're all one happy system here on Earth. We are one big system. We're trying to be happy. We're not happy everywhere in the same way. Is there anything you would like people just generally to know about the geospatial science field? I think it's exciting. And it's still probably, I wouldn't say in its infancy, but there's so much that we can still do. And there's just, so much we more that we need to do um, and some more ways that in which we can embed geospatial technologies. And when I say geospatial technologies, I mean GIS, I mean mm -hmm. remote sensing, I mean drone technology, I mean um, GPS technology, I mean data visualization, cartography, all of these things that are part of this big, big, and they can fit into, like you said, in, in, in different places. Um, and I think... The bottom line is it's an exciting time to be in geospatial and it will continue to be exciting because the more we understand about how things are connected to one another, the more we need to look at these connections and the more we need to, to, to connect the connectivities and make them make sense. And geospatial science can help us do that. Cool. Awesome. Well, I think that's a great way to wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> I agree. Thanks for being Thank here. Thank you.